Uh, you've titled one of your talks The Beleaguered Revolution in reference to Cuba. Could you give a, a brief overview of that beleaguered revolution? Okay, well, in, in order to understand something as complicated as Cuba, probably the best way is to, is to recognize what are the opposing processes that are at work. Is there are ways in which the revolution is being undermined, and there are also ways in which it's taking giant steps forward. And both of these are equally real. But first I would like to give some gen general notions about Cuba, correct some commonly held myths. But, well, one common myth is that Cuba refuses to change. In fact, Cuba is different every time I visit, and I've been visiting annually uh, for almost 30 years. Cuba has been changing in, in economic policy and political organization. In the 1970s, they started a rectification campaign against authoritarianism, against dogmatism, against corruption. Uh, they've developed, they've had a, pro a program of expanding elections. Uh, it may come as a surprise to people that Cuba, that Cuba does have elections and that there, in, in each, for each position, there are anywhere from, eight, from two to eight candidates running. Uh, they're non-party candidates. It's not a party slate. But they're selected on the basis of their ability to contribute to the revolution and the needs of the neighborhood rather than on the basis of opposing political platforms. <clears throat> so Cuba is a very dynamic society, and I often go there and ask friends about things that we're, we were all excited about during my previous visit, and they've been practically forgotten. Secondly, Cuba is not Castro. The press talks very casually about Castro's Cuba, or Castro does this, or Castro does that. You know, Castro has two roles in Cuba. First of all, he's become a symbol of the revolution. But secondly, he's also its most able politician. He's a very good listener. I've seen him at meetings of high school students, listening very carefully to the criticisms they were raising. He's very thoughtful. He's also a very aggressive debater. It's hard to win an argument with Castro not because he has the police behind him, but because he's very knowledgeable, very well informed, and very aggressive in his debating. But, he, uh, but you can win if you're well informed. At one time, uh, Castro was up in the mountains above Santiago, talking about how he looking at the soil and saying, this would be a lovely place for growing potatoes, and we'd get good crops, and we'd be able to supply the city. And somebody next to him nudges him and says, yes, you'll get a good crop the first year and a fair crop the second year. And by the third year, you'll be looking at bare rock. And so Castro looks at him and he says, well, that's why we need people who know their stuff around here. <laughs> so the, the image of Castro as capriciously dictating is not so. Sometimes Castro will first announce a program and it will, it will appear as if it came out of his head. But it's something that's been discussed and studied and thoughtfully looked over by a whole leadership group. So Cuba is not Castro. That, that's, that's the second important point. Third, in understanding the complexities of a society, it would be, there are a lot of oversimplifications that could be made by Cuba's friends or enemies. For instance, you couldn't say that Cuba is a completely just society, but it's the most just society we have in the Americas and possibly the world. It has not abolished racism, but it's been more committed to opposing racism than any place else. <coughs> Cubans really have, a have picked up on the identification of being an Afro-Caribbean culture. And the solidarity that Cubans felt with Angola was a very personal solidarity of coming to the aid of the homeland, which was different from the solidarity they had with Vietnam, which was more politically based. Cuba certainly has not abolished sexism, but there's a powerful women's movement. The, the questions of sexism are debated. They have a, an affirmative action program to increase women's positions in the leadership of the party and state, uh, and so on down the line. We, can't, we don't have a utopian image of Cuba, certainly. There are many problems, and there are many serious problems. There are problems of corruption. Uh, socialism doesn't abolish stupidity, and it doesn't abolish selfishness, but what it does do is abolish institutionalized greed and makes it possible to win arguments about the environment because nobody is making a living out of poisoning people. So with that, I can describe my attitude as saying, on the one hand, 100% behind the Cuban Revolution, and on the other, that doesn't commit me to supporting any particular decisions that the Cubans have made or to covering up any defects that I see in Cuban society. So this is different from the attitude of people who go in with a checklist as if they're going to grade the revolution and give them 
two points for equality and then subtract one point for residues of racism and so forth. With that background, I've been going to Cuba for 30 years, participating as a scientist in the development of Cuban science, particularly ecological agriculture. And the exciting news is that Cuba has finally committed itself quite strongly to building an ecological society. This is true in agriculture, where I know it best, but also in urban planning. Uh, for instance, developing wetlands as a way of filtering the water of the city, the use of bicycles for urban transport, and the commitment is strong enough so that they've, they've lowered the speed limit on the major streets and highways. There are bicycle lanes on the intercity highways, and there's bus service that carries bicycles across Havana Bay so that you can then proceed on bike. Now, of course, this is a response to the emergency, to the fact that they don't have oil. But it's also recognized as something desirable in its own right, good for people's health. And the community of people who are bicycling down the main streets toward work has a real conviviality that you would not get if people were driving in private cars or even you know, on buses. Uh, there's commitment to alternative sources of energy, to solar energy, wind power, as well as developing oil. And when you talk to people about these, these development plans, there's a great deal of excitement. On the other, on the other hand, Cuban li daily life is extremely difficult. Everything is in short supply. Toothpaste, toilet paper, tampons, newspapers are rare. Television only operates, I think, six hours a day and nine on weekends. Uh, so there's a lot of ways in which simple existence, getting to work, is a drag. And so the same people will talk to you in a kind of depressed sort of way, describing the difficulties of everyday life. And then with tremendous excitement when they talk about the innovations that they're carrying through or the battles that they're engaged in. There are many battles going on in Cuba. There's a lot of debate. Debate takes place in the workplaces in many organizations. Ecologists complain that sometimes their reports are not paid adequate attention to. But basically there's a commitment, a recognition that there's no way that they would like to revert to capitalism to become another uh, Thailand or Santo Domingo. Certainly no, they don't want to become a Yugoslavia or Russia. And even people who are more critical of the government would not allow the United States to tell them how to run their society. Furthermore, people are critical of government leaders or of government policies without being against the revolution. So there's, a, there's much more range of discussion that you would find in Cuba than you'd find in most parts of the United States. I had the privilege of watching a, a session of the National Assembly, which was on television one weekend. The delegates were debating three laws. One of them was the mining law. The committee which drafted the law uh, had recommended that they require any foreign enterprises that will have an impact on the environment to prepare very elaborate environmental impact statements. A delegate objected. Say, how can you expect somebody who's going to use the environment to write an honest report? And so they amended the law to require that the foreign companies finance independent study by Cuban agencies. That was the level of discussion. So you don't, you don't have the kind of horseplay, attachments of riders to bills, uh, political jockeying for position that you have in the American legislature, state and national. When they were debating the national defense law, somebody got up and said that as a member of Christians for Peace, he's very much concerned about conscientious objectors. And he wanted assurances that nobody would be forced to take military training. And he received that assurance, even though the spokesman for the uh, committee, the committee that drafted the legislation, said that they preferred not to institutionalize the process of alternative service, but certainly they weren't going to invest in training somebody to fight who's not going to fight. So Cuban, the Cuban Assembly is becoming a more serious body. One major way in which it is different from American legislatures is that they don't control patronage. And therefore, constituents can't go to their representatives to get help with parking tickets or to get a license to, uh, to build a business or something like that. And that weakens their kind of clout compared to legislators in, in, other, uh, in other contexts. On the other hand, it's a very hardworking group. Uh, they really draft legislation, and they concentrate on a handful of important bills in each session. Well, Cuba is besieged by the sudden collapse of the Eastern Bloc which meant a loss of something like 80% of their foreign trade almost instantaneously, something which would have wiped out any other economy. They're besieged by the American blockade and the various attempts to tighten that blockade. 
They are also besieged simply by being a third world country trying to use its resources in a just way. Other third world countries have been having a harder time with the recession, but what they've managed to do is distribute goods through price. And so the rich continue to be well off and the poverty is worse. In Cuba, uh, you don't have starvation. Rations are in short supply. At the present time, everybody is guaranteed through the rationing system enough food at low cost to last about two-thirds of the month. Then the rest of the time they have to buy food on the open market at higher prices. The price structure is such that the income from a single wage, let's say, can, can buy all of the rationed food you're entitled to, and then you have to supplement it by some other kind of income, so that somebody getting the minimum wage with a large family and only one wage earner would be rather hard-pressed, and that's something that they're looking into now. But by and large, uh, Cuba is a much more egalitarian society than anywhere else. And when something is in short supply, they make rational decisions as to how to use it. For instance, in the face of the milk shortage, milk is reserved for children up to the age of seven. Uh, soy milk is available up to the age of 14, and so on. So what's happening is that in the face of a hostile world economy, as a third world country, even if there wasn't the, the hostility of the United States, simply struggling as a third world country trying to maintain a just society is difficult. And in addition, they have the burdens of the United States blockade and the sudden loss of traditional trading partners. In the face of that, the Cuban economy is having a very difficult time. And now, only about five years after the fall of Moscow, you're beginning to see a recovery in Cuban industrial production, but not yet in agriculture. Agriculture is barely adequate. They're getting their rice needs met mostly by Vietnam and China. The Vietnamese, in particular, have a very high sense of international solidarity and uh, recognize the Cuban aid that they got during the war and have been exporting some of their surplus rice to Cuba. Well, Cuba has had to invite foreign capital. Allowing foreign capital into the tourist industry raises lots of problems. For instance, the tourist industry is notoriously racist. And an incident occurred where the new management of the Havana Libre Hotel was cutting back on staff, and the people they fired were mostly either black or party members, or both. And so the workers at the hotel refused to allow this, and the hotel management had to step back. The fact that foreign investors are helping the Cuban, the Cuban economy doesn't make them any less exploiters. And it'll be very important to see how the Cuban labor movement learns to adjust on the one hand, accepting the necessity of allowing exploitation, but on the other hand, recognizing that there's a conflict of interest between Cuban workers and foreign investors. Uh, in other areas, in the tourist industry, there have been some tendencies to use traditional tourism-type advertising, uh, using beautiful women, scantily clad, and so forth. And so a Women in the Media organization has been formed, Mahin, which is particularly interested in making sure that the, the accommodations that have to be made with world capitalism don't result in accepting a capitalist sexist culture. But that's going to be a difficult struggle. Uh, even though agriculture is committed to organic production and the getting rid of pesticides, for the high quality upscale grapefruit market in Chile, they have to spray. The Chilean purchasers want unblemished fruit. And so there are, way, there are ways in which Cuba has had to seed on the other hand, one, some of the ways in which they're facing the difficulties are tightening up the cooperation, the, the equality, uh, developing a serious commitment to ecological agriculture. By that I mean depending on biofertilizers as against imported chemical fertilizer. Biofertilizers are nitrogen-fixing bacteria and algae, uh, plants that fix nitrogen like legumes, worms that move the soil and keep the organic matter up, composting, mycorrhizae. These are fungi that live in association with the roots of plants. They reach out from the plant's roots, and it's sort of an, an auxiliary root system that allows them to mobilize phosphorus and potassium. Uh, they've increased diversification of agriculture, including mixed cropping as a way of pest control. For instance, in Olguin, they plant green peppers, but every 25 rows or so, there's a row of corn. The corn acts as an attractor, diverting the attention of the fruit worms that would otherwise attack the peppers. And this means that they can grow good peppers without pesticides. Uh, they're using ants in the protection of sweet potatoes. 
the ants form their nests around the developing sweet potato and keep away the beetles that otherwise would be digging galleries in the potato. Uh, the same ants are also used in the protection of bananas and of some other crops. They're cultivating land crabs, earthworms, a, a South American rodent, hutia, Capromus that is, which lives up in the treetops. And so I saw one place where the hutias were living up in the treetops and then their droppings were part of the food going to crabs, land crabs on the ground. Uh, recycling has been developing. On the Hermanos Nunez farm in Pinar del Rio, they, they raise pigs. Then the pig manure is used in, in the diet of geese. The geese droppings and feathers are dumped into the pond as fish food. The fish scales are cleaned and are turned over to the pigs. So a, a great deal of ingenuity is going into, de into developing rational methods of production. In mixed cropping, what you look for is to have each piece of ground not only producing a crop, but also contributing to the rest of the farm. So uh, sugarcane waste can be used as, as compost. It could also be used to, to grind up and grow yeast on it, and that can be then fed to the cattle. Soybeans can be interplanted in blocks with sugarcane that enriches the soil because sugarcane is a very hungry kind of crop. Uh, it also allows for more insect diversity that protects both kinds of crops. And the soybeans fix nitrogen that will benefit the cane. So this commitment to an ecological agriculture is partly out of conviction and partly out of necessity. We've had an ecological movement developing over the years, which has become increasingly self-confident and has been pushing for edu educating the public about ecological agriculture. Then there are also those people who would still prefer a high-tech mode, but recognize that it's not available, are grudging ecologists. And we see our task as converting the grudging ecologists into ecologists by conviction, and hope that we can do this before the economic blockade is lifted and there's the danger of the country being flooded. There's also a lot of confusion among people as to the directions that Cuba could face. If the Soviet Union couldn't build socialism in one country, how can you build it on one island? On the other hand, the Cuban situation is different. There's much more of a sense of unity in Cuba because of the sense of being colonized and threatened by imperialism. Uh, what they're trying to do is to keep intact a lot of the major, the major achievements of the revolution, health for all, universal free education, access to culture, relative egalitarianism, priorities in the use of natural resources, an ecologically oriented development of land use and of urban development, and doing this in the face of corrupting influences from the outside. So that, that's going to be difficult. I expect that the tourist industry will be a major source of corruption. Cubans who are trained to deal as business people with foreign business people will inevitably be picking up some of the values of their associates. People who are able to get dollars have access to more goods than those who don't, and about 20% of the Cubans now have access to dollars. So these are serious problems that Cubans are debating. The future of Cuba is certainly not guaranteed. As a scientist, aside from working on developing the technical aspects of ecological agriculture and training ecologists, I'm also concerned with keeping Cuban biology, defending it as a socially responsible, cooperative, uh, socialist conscious enterprise in the face of a lot of pressures to be self-financing, uh, to collaborate with foreign investors and so forth. That, that leaves a great deal of uncertainty. People who were raised as Marxists very often received an oversimplified kind of Marxism. Uh, they expected the world to be increasingly liberated. They expected that the socialist bloc would gradually expand until it included everybody. And to have to go back and start from scratch with only Cuba and the Americas uh, is quite a blow. So they have to think, if these, things, if these surprises caught us, what does this mean for the development of Marxism? I think that the hothouse Marxism, which was overly protected in Cuba in the past time, is weak and will begin to flourish when it's exposed to challenges from the outside and from within, with more open discussion, with challenges from ecologists, from feminism, I think this will be, on the whole, a healthy thing for the development of Cuban Marxism, which can absorb the insights of these, of these other movements. Uh, among the friends that I've known over the last 30 years, one of them has become a, an active counter-revolutionary. 
All the others continue to support the revolution. Some are critical of the government. Some of them are critical of particular policies. Many of them are frustrated when it's hard to convince uh, people of their ideas. Uh, but all of them are committed to, uh, to their socially responsible task as Cuban revolutionaries and as scientists. Uh, one of the things I carry away from Cuba is a sense of the possible. There's an environment of people caring for people in Cuba that I haven't seen any place else. A sense of solidarity, a sense of social responsibility, a very well-educated populace that's aware of problems internationally and that are concerned with such things. And that's part of the legacy of Cuban socialism. So what we're doing now is engaging in a struggle, first of all, to assure the survival of the Cuban Revolution, but secondly, to develop, to develop its socialism. This is very different from the policy of the more liberal element of U.S. capitalism, who would like to see a lifting of the blockade in order to wean Cuba toward capitalism and what they call democracy. But what they mean by democracy is the, the carnival of elections. If Cuba decided to have a multi-party system now, uh, then the problem becomes, can these parties be financed from the outside? Can they hire U.S. public relations firms? And in the end, you'd have the kind of stupidity which turned the last Nicaraguan election in, into a farce. Uh, so Cubans don't want that. They've had a lot of phony elections in Cuban history up to 1959 in what they call the pseudo-republic. Yet they are concerned about democracy, and they think that they're developing their own kind of democracy through the processes of decentralization, nationwide discussion, and uh, the incorporation of more and more sectors of the society in effective decision making. I'd like to follow that with a question about uh, the use of political language. I sent a transcript of the last interview that we did, and uh, my friend who read it was fascinated until he got to the last page where you were talking about the obligations of a revolutionary. Uh, you used the words communism um, and Marxism and even more frightening, revolutionary. Uh, this type of language, do you think it should be, we should refrain from using it or we should actively pursue it? Because uh, this is one case where a person who was intrigued by your commentary in the end was left alienated and frightened by the use of uh, political language such as Marxism, communism, revolution. Yes. I think it's, it's necessary to do both. The easy course is to adapt the language to what's easily accessible to people. And for instance, you, uh, you can have bumper stickers that say, food for people, not for profit. Health is a right, not a privilege. That's accessible to people. People can understand it. But it means that they don't generalize from it and step back and saying what you're talking about is criticizing capitalism. Capitalism is a pervasive system which is taken for granted. And we also must be able to criticize capitalism. Similarly, I use the term Marxism to insist that I consider that it's still the best analysis of society and of nature. It's the tool that I use in understanding the world. And people should know that it's not the caricature that they read about in the media. Now, what this means is that when we use the revolutionary terminology, terms like imperialism and capitalism and so forth, some people will dismiss the argument. And therefore, it's necessary that the same arguments be raised in other contexts, in other ways, so that people can grapple with the ideas without the fear. But at the same time, it's necessary in this time to affirm a pride in the communist tradition, uh, a recognition of the value of Marxism, and yes, the acknowledgement that we want is not simply better legislation to improve health care coverage, but a whole different way of relating to health. We do not want people's labor power to be a commodity. And that means breaking from capitalism. So I use revolution in that sense, transforming the underpinnings of society so that it's not driven by greed through a marketplace. Now, that will be frightening for some people. I am able to use that terminology because I am in a relatively secure, privileged position. I have the freedom to do that. And I see that one of the obligations of privilege is to use that privilege to say things that other people are unable to say. At the same time, it would not be helpful unless there were others who were talking in a less challenging, confrontational manner, simply challenging the individual manifestations of capitalism. So I think that, I think that both are necessary.
I am proud of the communist tradition, proud of my grandparents' struggle. Uh, I am proud of the comrades who fought fascism when nobody else did. I am proud of the intellectual challenge, the items that have become part of common understanding. For instance, the right of workers to organize, the right to limit the workday, to social security, to retirement. Benefits that were fought for through the labor movement, mostly under socialist leadership and Marxist leadership in the last century and in the early part of this century. I am proud of our tradition in taking up the struggles against racism and for, for women's equality, while aware also of a lot of the failings and even of the crimes committed in the name of communism. And I will not, I will not hide that in order to achieve a, a facile kind of popularity. So my answer to, to you is, your friend should stop being afraid. If the ideas of a communist Marxist revolutionary appeal to him, then maybe his notions about Marxism, communism, and revolution need changing. I'm going to switch directions here to medical education. Uh, uh, when you're talking about uh, the education of doctors, you often say that the framework in which they study is rather limited, and you've suggested some alternative course titles. Uh, for example, the cultural anthropology of cholesterol or uh, the pancreas under capitalism. Uh, what might be discussed in courses with those titles? We would start out with the normal functioning of the pancreas, let's say. One of the things that the pancreas does is produce insulin and the insulin manages sugar. Now sugar is in the diet but became an important part of the Western diet only after the slave trade made large-scale production of sugar in the, in the Americas possible. Before that, sugar was weighed out by the gram as a luxury item. All right, so then you cannot talk about sugar without asking, uh, what does it do in the diet? At the present time, the Pima Indians have a very high rate of diabetes. The reason for this is that historically they lived from hunting and gathering. That was a way of life in which there were periods of uh, of starvation, of shortage, along with periods of abundance. And their bodies adjusted to this, developing a kind of chemistry that can mobilize stored fat, that handles sugar in a certain way, but that makes them prone to diabetes once they move into an environment which is high in sugar. The Hopi Indians had a different way of life. They planted corn and they were able to keep about three years f corn supply in storage at any one time, so that the vagaries of the weather did not cause them to, fa to face starvation. So they do not have this particular kind of adaptation. So the biology of the Pima under capitalism is a combination of their past as being hunters and gatherers and the role of the sugar industry in determining, uh, determining what we eat. The sugar is used as a preservative in foods. Uh, a lot of foods that you wouldn't expect in the, that, are, that are not desserts are also sweetened. The tremendous influx of sugar into the diet is partly a result of the development of the sugar business. And so you have to deal with that when, when you're dealing with the prevalence of diabetes and its distribution. Or the adrenals are an organ for dealing with stress. And there are many kinds of stress. There's acute stress that may come from being almost run down by a car or having a building collapse on you. But there's also the chronic stress of alienating work, of harassment, of worrying about making ends meet, uh, the low intensity racism which is a constant feature of, of the lives of many Afro-American Lat and Latino people. Uh, for instance, the kind of awareness of a teenager going into a store and knowing, knowing that everybody's going to be watching to see if he's a thief. Uh, the wondering when you're walking down the street towards somebody whether to make eye contact, whether to, whether to say hello or not say hello. Uh, so these things wear on people's bodies. The, uh, the cerebral cortex, the advanced sections of the brain, are a link between society and our physiology. And in order to understand people's health problems, we have to look at the whole gamut of health problems. The relationship between a way of life in which you have to smoke to keep sane, an alienating job, uh, the junk food that you eat during a half hour lunch break, the decisions that you have to make as to whether you will take the day off and go to a doctor for some complaint, or the, the body posture, which affects the, de the depth of your breathing, the muscle tensions, the, the location of aches and pains in different parts of the body, uh, the 
50,000 different kinds of synthetic molecules that are in our environment as a result of our industry. So all of this is creating an impact on the body in various ways, which means that our body is a product of our society. It's not only the result of 300 million years of vertebrate evolution, it's also a result of living in a particular social context. And we have to be able to understand that. So medical students should realize that our bodies are biological, but that doesn't make them any less social. And they're social without being any less biological. So one of the first principles is to understand the human body as a socialized biology. Another is to recognize that epidemiology is a social relation between ourselves and other organisms, uh, ourselves in mosquitoes, ourselves in mice, to understand the political economy of rats in urban centers. At a, at a level that gets you closer to the clinical, it also means recognizing that phenomena which are treated generally as ser very different categories, like uh, infection, chronic disease, poisoning, psychological disease, or diseases of aging, are not really all that different, or that heredity is inseparable from environment. In fact, what we have are environments that magnify hereditary differences. When an organism is under stress, small differences in the chemistry make a big difference. And that's what happens with uh, some of the so-called genetic diseases. Uh, insofar as somebody is more prone to carcinogens, it would be described as having a gene for cancer. So one of the things that we have to do is break down the hard and fast barriers between the different subfields that you would study in medical school, recognize that the problems are both social and biological. Uh, I think it would also be important to look at the history of medicine and to recognize that a lot of our therapies are derived from the development of the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry has the goal of turning chemicals like oil as a, as a feedstock into something that you can give out as free samples to doctors and have sold to, to patients. This means that when an ad comes on on television, you don't see somebody saying, you're suffering from a headache, uh, what was stressful at work today? or breathe deeply, or think about your situation, they will say, reach for this particular pill, which is better than somebody else's pill. So the, the young medical students should recognize that the reason they handled the, handed this particular toolkit is because of the way in which research has been owned, giving the doctors a pattern of knowledge and ignorance, uh, such that they're frustrated by the ignorance, grateful for the knowledge, but not questioning what kind of knowledge we need in order to be able to be better physicians. We realize that diseases are not really treatable as separate entities. Uh, if we have a vaccination campaign against measles, for example, this may increase the death rate from other things. Uh, diseases interact with each other. Pollutant can open up the lungs to infection. Infections can weaken the immune system so that worse infections can come in. A mild condition that causes you to sneeze might facilitate the spread of a serious disease. And so we have to be able to look at the health, the health patterns of populations and of individuals in their full context. If I had a blackboard here, I would draw a diagram showing the relationship among insulin, blood sugar, adrenaline, anxiety, harassment on the job, and shop stewards. And I would show how everybody has a common core of physiological pathways, but they differ in the way the stress pattern operates the methods for alleviating stress, and therefore the, the clinical object becomes a socialized person living in a particular context. You can tell a well-off executive to go home, take a week's vacation, and it'll do your heart so good. You can't tell a seamstress uh, living alone or with a male chauvinist pig of a husband to go home and take it easy. So part of the lesson is that is wholeness. The second lesson is to see how things got the way they are without taking it for granted. But it's not obvious. Things are the way they are because they got that way, and we have to understand how they got that way. And we apply that also to our own knowledge, to our own preferences in diagnosis, in therapy, and so forth. And finally, then, we would have to have medical students thinking about the course of development of the health of our society, not simply the therapies, not simply the political economy of healthcare, which is important, but also all of those changes in our economy which create the diseases that our modern technology copes with. Now, the United States 
spends a lot more than most other countries on health care, but is not healthier because of it. And the reason is that we both try harder to make people sick and also harder to make them better and to make a profit in the process. On the uh, comment about executives versus seamstresses and people taking time off to recover, the, uh, I think it was the president of Harvard took a few months off and he was applauded in the media for uh, his wisdom in recognizing when he was overstressed, but they didn't put that in proper context. Uh, earlier we spoke about the bell curve. There was another book out this year called The Coming Plague, and uh, that received a lot of coverage in the media as well. It painted a very bleak picture of the future. What's, what's your take on The Coming Plague? I know the author because she was a member of the working group on new diseases at Harvard during her sabbatical from her newspaper. She's a journalist. And she saw her mission as waking up the public to the, to the need to prepare, that recognizing that we are not prepared to confront these diseases. That means that it has a journalistic style, which might be off-putting to some health professionals. But basically, her message is correct. Our society and our health system is not prepared to meet the new health problems that are being created by the way in which we're tampering with the environment, taking into account only economic considerations. In a pamphlet titled uh, The Need for Social Ownership, uh, the, there's a discussion about what they call real democracy. And in this discussion, they say that in this new electronic interactive democracy, we not only make all decisions, we formulate all the questions too. I can see that as a possibility, but there seems to be a downside to electronic democracy, and that is that it isolates people. There's no real face-to-face -face, face -face interaction. What do you think about this electronic democracy? Even Ross Perot himself uh, discussed electronic democracy a few years back. I think the trouble with a lot of the discussion about the internet or the information highway is that it doesn't deal with the sociology of it, the question of who owns what. Now in a certain sense computers are relatively cheap and have spread through the middle class. There is much of the world that doesn't have access to it. Uh, at the present time it's a relatively free good the way radio was in the, 19 te in the teens and 1920s. And that's being promoted in order to create the market. But already we're beginning to see the attempts of private industry to get control of the internet. It's going to be difficult for them to do so. They're going to have to be rather ingenious in finding ways of charging money for it, of uh, excluding what they don't want to hear, or simply of swamping ideas that they don't like in a tremendous mass of information. And that requires that you be even more better informed to, to navigate in the in the deluge of what passes for information, much of which is noise. Uh, the religious right has been worried about pornography on the internet. The greater indecency, I think, is commerce getting onto the internet, make, uh, invading the homes with sales pitches, with cultural homogenization. It becomes a, f a process undermining the rights of nations to control their own environment by creating an environment controlled by a few communications corporations. So that's the downside. The upside is that it's still difficult to control. People have ways of avoiding control. There's a much broader access now than there was before. And the use of electronic communications really facilitated the Zapatista movement in Chiapas. Uh, I think that corpora the corporate world, particularly the communications monopolies, are going to be struggling to get control of information more completely. Uh, and that we have to fight a rear guard action preventing, from, preventing them from doing so. I appreciate also what you said about the absence of face-to-face -face contact. That it will allow jobs to be decentralized in such a way that workers in the shop can't talk to each other because they're not in the same shop. They're scattered over the world. It can be used to prevent organizing, but it could also be an organizing tool, which means that people are going to be snooping, see, seeing who's talking up union to whom. Uh, I don't, want, I don't want to engage in futuristic predicting because the only real kind of prediction that, that's possible to make in complex systems is to identify what are the opposing forces. There are forces toward uh, increasing the commoditization of information and its use and control. 
and there is resistance to it. And so the only recommendation I could make is obviously to join on the side of resistance, to fight the corporate domination, the uh, swamping of information by the right, and so forth. There's a, a tendency to denigrate technology recently, perhaps uh, as a result of what you're describing, uh, this overabundance of information. We have the uh, Una bomber, who is uh, very much anti-technological. And um, also we have people trying to escape from uh, all of the, the deluge of information into uh, various movements, New Age movements, mystic movements, uh, right-wing religious movements. Uh, how closely linked uh, do you see those two factors, this, uh, oh, this uh, intrusion of technology into our lives and then the need for people to escape into New Ageism or mysticism? Well, back in 1848, Marx won that what capitalism does is turn all aspects of life into commodities. What technology does is allow capitalist relations to penetrate in corners they couldn't reach before. So, for instance, it's now possible to have wombs for rent, kidneys for sale. Uh, people can sell the corneas of their eyes. Uh, people are not only selling their hours of labor power, but their actual physical movements become under increasing control. So what happens is that technology results in an increased dehumanization and commodification of existence, which is very alienating and which people are responding to in various ways, mostly individually. Uh, it is also possible to raise the question, why doesn't technology result in a reduction of the workday? Why don't we have more leisure and more tranquility instead of more commodities? Now, clearly, from the economic point of view of investors, that would be a disaster. From the human point of view, it would be beneficial, so that there's a struggle over the uses of technology in which the weapons of the marketplace tend to prevail over objections. Once people have a little bit of space in their own personal lives economically, they can make individual choices to use some of that surplus to alleviate some of the pain caused by capitalism, some of the alienation. So the CEO who plans urban renewals around the cities can go off to the woods in Maine and have a kind of personal alleviation. You, uh, if the water is impure, you can buy bottled water. Not too f far in the future, we'll be able to buy bottled oxygen to use in polluted cities. Uh, but as people's lives become more commoditized, as you go to special healers to get emotional support, to get affection, to get touch, well, there's certainly necessarily a repugnance against this. And part of the repugnance is the new, a new agey movement. Now, much of the new age criticism of commercialized life is valid. Much of the importance of improving health through integrating the body and mind is again a valid strategy. What I find unsatisfactory about the alternative health movements is that too often they stop at the skin and do not consider health for everybody they presume a degree of control over resources that most people don't have. Nevertheless, I think that there's a lot positive in it, and I would like to see at least some of the aspects of self-care, interest in exercise and diet, incorporated into movements that would make good food available to everybody, leisure for exercise available to everybody, and should certainly be part of a socialist program. Perhaps one of the failings of the traditional left has been not paying sufficient attention to the politics of individual life and ways in which we can protect people against the inroads of corporations before we get near abolishing them. It's not enough to say pe to people you're sick because of pollution. But what do I do now? And we have to be able to integrate the individual and the large scale. And the feminist slogan that the personal is political is an opening in that direction as long as it doesn't become depoliticized. So I'm critical of, of the most of the New Age movements for their indifference to political struggle, but sympathize with their criticism of the, of the decay of capitalist daily life. Jean Cocteau said that uh, poetry is indispensable if I only knew what for. Uh, there's a long history of radical poetry, music, uh, 
painting, literature, uh, it seems to have disappeared. Uh, what, what role now can radical art play in revolutionizing people? Well, first of all, I don't think that it has disappeared. It's perhaps less visible. But there are groups that are doing artwork on behalf of the labor and other insurgent movements. My son works with the Northland Poster Collective in Minneapolis, which does posters keeping alive radical and progressive traditions and challenging the prevailing mythologies. Art and poetry are expressions of the way people interpret the world and decide how the world should be. Generally, how you understand the world and how you think the world uh, how the world is and how the world should be are closely related. In normal times, one implies the other. The way, the way things are is the way they should be in most cultural thinking. Uh, but it's also possible to challenge. These are the way th things are and they shouldn't be. They ought to be different. And what art and poetry do is explore ways in which re uh, the, the real world is unsatisfactory, ways in which it might be different. And they do this at very rich and different levels. So in a sense, if you ask the question, should art and poetry be political? It's a false question. It simply is. And the question is, shall it be self-conscious or not? And if it's political, political on whose behalf? But by political, I don't mean the crass sense of writing election songs, campaign songs, and jingles, but rather in probing the most important issues facing our collective and individual lives. And I think the individual life and the collective life are very, are very much related. So these explorations should be encouraged uh, without having preconceived notions as to what the outcome ought to be. It's one of the ways of thinking that we think about the world in a convergent kind of way, analytically, statistically, theoretically, and we also think about the world in more impressionistic ways. And so the artistic and scientific pr approaches to life are complementary, and furthermore, they coexist. I know that in my scientific work, there's a strong aesthetic component that guides research choices and conceptualizations. And I know that writers, poets, artists, think about the world as well as express themselves. It's not simply a spontaneous outpouring, but it's outpouring in ways that, that, that tap into the, to the less verbal as well as, the, the, as well as verbal expression. We're in New Hampshire. And uh, soon, New Hampshire will be invaded by numerous presidential candidates. Are elections uh, meaningful, or have they been reduced to mere spectacle? And how can we uh, become more integral in uh, developing movements that will alter that, uh, the uh, political arena in which uh, these candidates will be operating? Well, that, that's, really, that's really a tough one. It is true that elections have become increasingly meaningless. First of all, because there's less difference between the major parties. But secondly, because the platforms of parties are designed by public relations people through pollsters. And therefore, you have less and less reason to expect that the political line presented by a candidate will be political policy when elected. Third, because so many of the important decisions affecting our life do not take place in the government, but in the boardrooms. And government very often has no choice but to accede to the wishes of the corporations if they're not going to rally the people in a confrontational stance. Politics has become increasingly corrupt and increasingly expensive. So for all of these reasons, it's become less meaningful. On the other hand, there's been an increase in independent political activity at a local level. And at that level, uh, People have been, have been intervening much more in a political process that used to be the domain of the professional politicians. Sometimes they do this in a right-wing direction. But even where there's an upsurge of the religious right, what it does do is place on the agenda, how shall our lives be run, not taking for granted that the way things are are the way things have to continue. So I think that we have to analyze in each situation how much leeway is there for challenging the current thinking offering sometimes by running candidates, sometimes just by raising issues. And I, I wouldn't presume to present an electoral strategy when it has to be so particular and so complex. Uh, I do not discard elections as an arena for political action, but I also do not believe that major political change in the world takes place through elections. 
More commonly what happens is that at best elections ratify political changes that have occurred elsewhere, that have taken place in the streets and people's thinking. And the battle to change thinking is the crucial arena in which, uh, in which politics will be fought out. The value of the election then is that it's the opportunity to challenge thinking. But the strategy of conf confronting reactionary ideas, even in choosing the terms of discourse, for instance, it is not a free market. The market belongs to those who own the market. It's a private market, but not a free market. So even battling around concepts in that way, the use of the term crime is misleading. Most crime is taking place invisibly. So the, uh, the violence of Pentagon generals, the greed of uh, investment brokerage house executives, the petty theft that takes place in every office and factory is part of a normal criminal process. So when people talk about crime and a war against crime, we always have to place adjectives in front of it. Are you talking about individual, spontaneous, violent crime? Are you talking about well thought out violent crime, corporate crime, intermediate level crime of the, the small entrepreneurs as they evolve into, into the corporations of violence? of organized crime? Are you talking about the crime which is rewarded in Congress, the crimes that go in unpunished? And so when government raises uh, legislation, for instance, for crime control, I would like to see the left demanding that there be a whole chapter on abuse of public trust as a, a category of criminal, of criminal offense. And that would have two subheadings, the ripping off of, the, of government resources for private gain and the abuse the abuse of public trust on behalf of the corpora corporations coll collectively, uh, the violation of constitutional oath by presidents, by military officers, and so forth. So it's a question of challenging the notion. If you allow them to get away with letting crime mean simply street corner muggings, then you're, you're distorting the nature of crime and allowing them to put their usual racist spin on it. Uh, the same thing about welfare. When you talk about welfare, you have to consider, well, who gets the ripoffs? If the government sends uh, negotiators to Japan to open the market for American automobiles, isn't that welfare? So at each place, it's important for a left to challenge the prevailing ideas. Insofar as we can use election campaigns to do that, wonderful. That's one of the ways of getting attention. But, uh, and certainly people like Bernie Sanders have managed to take a single seat in Congress and use it to, to do a lot of good. So I'm not anti-electoral, but I do not place my faith in elections. I don't think that there is any case in, in history where an election has resulted in a shift of power to the people. I've seen cases where elections have, have resulted in progressive governments. Allende was elected to the presidency of Chile, but never to state power. Aristide was not restored to power, he was restored to the presidency. And even an electoral victory in Haiti still leaves in doubt who holds power in the country, both because of the presence of the United States and because of the economic power of the Haitian oligarchy. While challenging that Haitian oligarchy, even through legal means, will bring on external pressures. So uh, we should avoid, uh, we should not let them get away with identifying democracy with elections or elections with multi-party elections. We should not let them believe that elections are the only way to achieve change but we could plunge in without having any great expectations of the existing political parties. I could see us engaging in the, in, in the way we can to really challenge the way they're ruling. Last question, uh, devil's advocate question. Uh, many people will say that the, uh, the communist revolutionary system that you describe is appealing, but it won't work because human beings are naturally violent, they're naturally greedy, they're naturally competitive, and they need to be rewarded in order to work. How do you respond to that? Well, first of all, it's a false anthropology. In fact, one of the problems that the World Bank has in spreading capitalism into the Amazon is that the people there, when they, uh, when they lend money, when they lend goods, don't demand repayment. They see that as a gift which will eventually come back to them well in some way. They're offended at the idea of as anybody asking for repayment. Uh, they find it offensive to try to get be the better of somebody in a deal. Uh, 
In fact, they lack all of these bourgeois virtues that others tell us are natural. <clears throat> when, uh, to, to say that something is natural and inevitable is a copping out. First of all, it denies human history, it denies comparative anthropology, and it denies human, human possibility. So that's one side of the response. The second side of the response is that elements of what we want to see in a future society have existed in various places in various times. There have been societies which have been far more egalitarian, of, have greater equality of men and women than our own. The democracy of the I Iroquois Confederacy was a far more democratic system than that of parliamentary uh, democracy in Europe. The collectivities that have survived in the Andes in indigenous communities also involve a different kind of democracy. The Zapatistas are so slow in reaching decisions because nobody is in charge of making them, because an issue will be debated in all the villages and the debates themselves may last for weeks or months. So I, I would reject any idea which attributes the way things are to the claim that we're just naturally that way. That's one of the harms done by biological determinist arguments. What's natural for people is to be changeable. And people are changeable in a way that corresponds to their lives. So then we have to come back to the question, why is it that the attempts to build socialist societies had such disastrous results? And that, that requires a very long kind of answer. One major element was that it was the attempt to build a future with materials of the past without acknowledging that and without confronting the problems of corruption, hierarchy, and careerism that will be carried over even into the first stages of a new society. By underestimating those problems, less attention was paid to the consolidation of grassroots democracy. And therefore, this grassroots democracy was easily sidetracked under the slogans of necessity when faced with threats from the outside. I think in some ways the incipient socialisms accepted too much, too much borrowing too much from capitalist technology, capitalist ways of organizing production, capitalist economics. And in the end, what's been proven is that capitalists make better capitalists than communists do. We have to be able to find, find ways of developing the alternative strategy for building a society. And that's going to be a collective mobilization of the intelligence of all of us. So no. Uh, but we might turn the question around and ask, has capitalism ever fulfilled its promise of equality, openness, and so forth? And we see that's not the case, that the relative democracies that have been achieved in Europe have been at the expense of the, their own working people and even more so of the peoples of the colonial world. And they've had several centuries to try with pretty complete domination. Now, at the present time, the prospects look bleak for an immediate overthrow of capitalism. On the other hand, what capitalism is doing to the quality of life, to the environment, to people's health, to human relations, uh, makes it even more urgent that we put an end to that system and that we put all of our best thinking into how to replace it. Uh, because, because of that catastrophe of capitalism, do you see these as prime time for organizing? Definitely. I think that the left is in a state of shock still from the, uh, the debacle of 1989 and 90. It'll take a while to reconstitute. One element in reconstituting is coming to terms with our past to make sure that the worst, the worst abuses, and I don't want to put, pass them off as errors, but rather as crimes, that these worst abuses and crimes committed in the name of revolution do not recur. We have to make sure of that in our organizational structure and in our ideology. But we must also go ahead and challenge capitalism thoroughly and not say that, the, that history has ended and all we can hope to do is ameliorate its worst abuses. That way it would lead to a, a, real, a real global crisis of the species. So yes, this is a time when we have to get our act together. We're passing through a period of retreat where we're conserving the enclaves that survive, the enclaves of independent thought, the enclaves of socialist vision, the knowledge accumulated by the labor movement, the combative spirit of a labor movement, the pieces will have to start coalescing. After a while, we'll realize that struggling only around the most urgent issues of our own immediate community in the end will be frustrating, and that we once again have to put it all together into a global challenge against capitalism pervasively in all aspects of, of its manifestations. Their ability to contribute to the revolution and the needs of the neighborhood rather than on the basis of opposing political platforms. <clears throat>
So Cuba is a very dynamic society, and I often go there and ask friends about things that we were all excited about during my previous visit, and they've been practically forgotten. Secondly, Cuba is not Castro. The press talks very casually about Castro's Cuba, or Castro does this, or Castro does that. Now, Castro has two roles in Cuba. First of all, he's become a symbol of the revolution. But secondly, he's also its most able politician. He's a very good listener. I've seen him at meetings of high school students, listening very carefully to the criticisms they were raising. He's very thoughtful. He's also a very aggressive debater. It's hard to win an argument with Castro, not because he has the police behind him, but because he's very knowledgeable, very well informed, and very aggressive in his debating. But, he, uh, but you can win if you're well informed. At one time, uh, Castro was up in the mountains above Santiago, talking about how he looking at the soil and saying, this would be a lovely place for growing potatoes. And we'd get good crops, and we'd be able to supply the city. And somebody next to him nudges him and says, yes, you'll get a good crop the first year and a fair crop the second year. And by the third year, you'll be looking at bare rock. And so Castro looks at him and he says, well, that's why we need people who know their stuff around here. And there are many serious problems. There are problems of corruption. Uh, socialism doesn't abolish stupidity, and it doesn't abolish selfishness, but what it does do is abolish institutionalized greed and makes it possible to win arguments about the environment because nobody is making a living out of poisoning people. So with that, I can describe my attitude as saying, on the one hand, 100% behind the Cuban Revolution, and on the other, that doesn't commit me to supporting any particular decisions that the Cubans have made or to covering up any defects that I see in Cuban society. So this is different from the attitude of people who go in with a checklist as if they're going to grade the revolution and give them two points for equality and then subtract one point for residues of racism and so forth. With that background, I've been going to Cuba for 30 years, participating as a scientist in the development of Cuban science, particularly ecological agriculture. And the exciting news is that Cuba has finally committed itself quite strongly to building an ecological society. This is true in agriculture, where I know it best, but also in urban planning. Uh, for instance, developing wetlands as a way of filtering the water of the city, the use of bicycles for urban transport, and the commitment is strong enough so that they've, they've lowered the speed limit on the major streets and highways. There are bicycle lanes on the intercity highways, and there's bus service that carries bicycles across Havana Bay so that you can then proceed on bike. Now, of course, this is a response to the emergency, to the fact that they don't have oil. But it's also recognized as something desirable in its own right, good for people's health. And the community of people who are bicycling down the main streets toward work has a real conviviality that you would not get if people were driving in private cars or even you know, on buses. Uh, there's commitment to alternative sources of energy, to solar energy, wind power, as well as developing oil. And when you talk to people about these, these development plans, there's a great deal of excitement. On the other, on the other hand, Cuban li daily life is extremely difficult. Everything is in short supply. Toothpaste, toilet paper, tampons, newspapers are rare. Television only operates, I think, six hours a day and nine on weekends. Uh, so there's a lot of ways in which simple existence, getting to work, is a drag. And so the same people will talk to you in a kind of depressed sort of way, describing the difficulties of everyday life, and then with tremendous excitement when they talk about the innovations that they're carrying through or the battles that they're engaged in. There are many battles going on in Cuba. There's a lot of debate. Debate takes place in the workplaces in many organizations. Ecologists complain that sometimes their reports are not paid adequate attention to. But basically there's a... Yeah, you've titled one of your talks, The Beleaguered Revolution, in reference to Cuba. Could you give a, a brief overview of that beleaguered revolution? OK, well, in, in order to understand something as complicated as Cuba, probably the best way is to, is to recognize what are the opposing processes that are at work. Because there are ways in which the revolution is being undermined, and there are also ways in which it's taking giant steps forward. And both of these are equally real. But first, I would like to give some gen general notions about Cuba, correct some commonly held myths. But well, one common myth is that Cuba refuses to change. In fact, Cuba is different every time I visit, and I've been visiting annually uh, for almost 30 years. 
Cuba has been changing in, in economic policy and political organization. In the 1970s, they started a rectification campaign against authoritarianism, against dogmatism, against corruption. Uh, they've developed, they've had a, pro a program of expanding elections. Uh, it may come as a surprise to people that Cuba, that Cuba does have elections and that there, in, in each, for each position, there are anywhere from eight, from two to eight candidates running. Uh, they're non-party candidates, it's not a party slate. But they're selected on the basis of the... So the, the image of Castro as capriciously dictating is not so. Sometimes Castro will first announce a program and it will, it will appear as if it came out of his head. But it's something that's been discussed and studied and thoughtfully looked over by a whole leadership group. So Cuba is not Castro, that, that's, that's the second important point. Third, in understanding the complexities of a society, it would be, there are a lot of oversimplifications that could be made by Cuba's friends or enemies. For instance, you couldn't say that Cuba is a completely just society, but it's the most just society we have in the Americas and possibly the world. It has not abolished racism, but it's been more committed to opposing racism than any place else. <coughs> Cubans really have, have picked up on the identification of being an Afro-Caribbean culture and the solidarity that Cubans felt with Angola was a very personal solidarity of coming to the aid of the homeland, which was different from the solidarity they had with Vietnam, which was more politically based. Cuba certainly has not abolished sexism, but there's a powerful women's movement. The, the questions of sexism are debated. They have a, an affirmative action program to increase women's positions in the leadership of the party and state, uh, and so on down the line. We, can't, we don't have a utopian image of Cuba, certainly. There are many problems.